Hello, welcome back to Into the Blue. Hope everyone's doing all right. This week, I'm going to be looking at the top five Australian films of the decade. So let's take a look. At number five, These Final Hours. So this film takes place in Perth, 10 minutes after an asteroid has just hit Earth uh, and it's hitting the North Atlantic. So they've basically got around 12 hours until the ripple effect just keeps coming out and to hit Australia and just wipes out everyone and everything on the planet. So we follow James, who has just been told by his girlfriend that she's pregnant, but he's not having any of it. He wants to block out feelings for everyone and everything because he knows what's coming. So he just gets angry, starts shouting at her, won't have it at all, and he just leaves. He wants He's had an invite to the party of all parties, and that's where he's going to go, and that's where he wants to be. So all around, people are going absolutely crazy. There's murders, there's people just taking drugs, there's looting. Uh, James himself gets off to a really bad start. His car has been stolen. He comes across these two blokes and they basically kidnap this little girl. He goes to walk away, but he overhears them talking about the fact that they're going to rape her. So, he, you know, he's not the best of people, but, you know, even he can't allow that. He goes back to confront them, ends up having to kill them just to rescue the girl. The girl's called Rose. So it turns out that Rose has been split up from her dad and they were en route to go and stay with Rose's auntie. But James, he's still just thinking about this party. He wants to get there as soon as he can. Um, so the quickest thing to do is to go and drop Rose off with his sister. So he drives, steals a car, drives Rose to his sister's house. But when he gets there, he found, finds that his sister the sister's husband and their three children have basically taken their own lives. So there are lots of little side stories and all these sort of side missions of trying to find Rose's dad, but none of them end well. They eventually get to this party and everybody is out of their minds. There are orgies taking place. There are people playing uh, Russian roulette for real. Uh, the owner of the house where the party is, he's the most unhinged out of everyone. He's waving a gun around everywhere and he shows James this um, underground bunker that he's made, which is just an absolute joke. But in the meantime, Rose has been sort of taken to the side by some party goers and they've given her ecstasy. So obviously things are just going from bad to worse. James finds out what's going on. He again rescues her, but in doing so, things get even worse still. Uh, and he basically commits himself now to doing the right thing and reuniting Rose with the rest of her family. This film moves along at such a great pace. It's just got this real amazing energy to it. This film crisscrosses the lines of action-packed, disturbing, to really emotional, and it pulls it off with ease. The two leads are absolutely sensational, and they go through every range of emotions possible. Um, it's clear from the people that we meet from James's past that he hasn't always been a good lad. He's not always been the best of people, but now that the end is close, I think he basically sees Rose as his last chance of redemption. At number four, Sweet Country. So this film is set in Alice Springs in 1929 and it's based on a true story. We follow Sam Kelly, who's an Aboriginal farm worker and he's employed by a preacher called Fred. Fred has agreed to lend Sam out with his wife, Lizzie, to a neighbouring farmer called Harry. Harry has been really badly affected by his involvement in World War I and now as a result... He's basically an abusive alcoholic. He's just a really nasty, spiteful man. Sam's main job that he's there for is to go out and mend some fencing. But before he can do that, he has to go out and round up some cattle. So whilst he's gone, Harry has found Sam's wife, Lizzie. And he basically goes into where she's staying and rapes her. Hours later, when Sam returns, he finds out what's happened and Lizzie begs and pleads with him not to do anything, not to retaliate. You know, she isn't daft. She knows that because they're uh, Aborigines and because of the time that this is set, that he's just going to end up in prison or dead. So they leave and they go back to the farm that they live and work at. And obviously Sam isn't happy, but they, they carry on. But then Harry turns up. He turns up for something completely unrelated. He's actually looking for a runaway Aborigine that he had chained up at his farm. So a confrontation takes place and things happen. 
and it ends up with Sam and Lizzie having to take off across the outback. So as I mentioned earlier, for people like Sam back then, this was a time and place where it was a case of guilty until proven innocent, and they know that. And even the sergeant that's there to lead the manhunt to find them, he's had some gallows built before he even hears the story of what's actually happened. This is a really powerful drama, and it was really difficult to shake off. Um, it looks at integrity, at racism, authority and injustice and it just does it in a really engrossing way. The leads all put in fantastic performances and the actor that plays Sam, this is actually his first on-screen role which is pretty unbelievable. This is one of those rare films that can enrage you and inspire you at the same time. At number three hounds of love so this is a crime thriller and it's set in the suburbs of perth and it's loosely based on a true story vicky is this teenager that's staying with her mum at the weekends after the, her parents recent separation she sneaks out one night to go to a party walking down the street and she's running late car pulls up alongside her she weighs them up thinks they look harmless enough gets in they say well we'll just go back to our house first we've got some drugs that we can sort you out with for your party so she goes in, they give her a drink, but they spite the drink. She wakes up, tied to a bed in the spare room. Then the torment begins, both psychological and physical. The couple, John and Evelyn, they're not criminal masterminds, they're just vile predators, and they would use the simplest of methods to entice youngsters into their car, take them back to the house, drug them, and eventually murder them. Because this was set in the 80s, it was easy, easily done by them because it was a much more trusting time. This couple are scary. They are completely unhinged. Um, John is definitely the dominant one, um, but you just get the second that any time now they're going to burst into the room and brutally murder Vicky. But the film starts to slowly peel away and unfold these layers of the couple's relationship. And we learn that through Vicky listening in to them arguing. So basically Vicky works out that her only chance of survival is going to be to try and drive a wedge in between them both. But in the meantime, Vicky's mum is desperately searching day and night trying to find her child. Vicky is in this really dark world of violence and domination and she just knows that her own murder is imminent. The director avoids showing all of the violence but really ratchets up the tension in a really clever way where our imaginations are piecing together what's happening to Vicky in between the scenes that we see. Having said that, this is very brutal in places. It is a really unsettling film to watch. This couple just really unnerved me and they often pop back into my mind. They are just pure evil and this is where the film pulls its power from. The hopelessness that we feel watching this young girl imprisoned, knowing what this couple have done to all the kids that have come before her. We as the viewer just get to stare evils straight in the eye and that is really hard to forget. At number two, Mystery Road. So this is set in a rural town in Queensland and a body of an Aboriginal girl has just turned up. Put on the case is an Aboriginal detective called Jay Swan. He's just returned from the city and he quickly finds out that the girl was actually a drug addict that would have sex with truck drivers for money. Before he realises that he's in and over his head, he is. He finds out that other children have gone missing and everywhere he turns he is completely shut down. The local police don't want to know because he's an Aborigine. The Aborigines won't talk to him because he's a policeman. So he basically finds out very quickly that the entire area is just completely corrupt. The locals just get to do whatever they want and the police just make up their own rules. And if you don't fall in line with this way of life, then very, very bad things will happen. Jay eventually turns his focus to a couple of the locals and the police themselves. They retaliate by trying to intimidate Jay, but they've completely underestimated him. And then it leads into an all out war. This is a slow burn noir thriller that keeps slowly building up the tension but there are so many standout scenes including a near wordless 15 minute amazingly choreographed gunfight. 
The film looks absolutely great. It's desolate with huge skies and low horizons and these bright orange sunsets. You can just feel the heat beating down onto the dusty ground. If you can imagine a racially motivated Chinatown set in the outback, then you won't be far off. Not bad for a film that shot, edited, written and scored by the director, Ivan Sen. At number one, Wish You Were Here. Joel Edgerton plays Dave. He has a young child and a pregnant wife called Alice. Alice's sister Steph spends a lot of time with them both and Steph has recently got a new boyfriend called Jeremy. So they go out as a foursome and Jeremy sort of explains to them all quite vaguely that he's the businessman and he's got to go out to Cambodia and they should all go as a foursome. You know, he says if you can get the grandparents to look after your child I'll pay for everything it'll be a great holiday it'll be fantastic so Steph is obviously really up for it uh, but Dave and Alice aren't so sure um, but they sort of convince themselves by thinking well once our child's born we're not going to get a chance like this for some time so they agree to go so the holiday is going great and after a night of partying Jeremy vanishes completely vanishes to the point where they have to actually finish the holiday and leave and go home back to Australia without him. So once they get back home, each of the three have these sort of varying degrees of knowledge as to what actually happened and are slowly beginning to put the pieces of the puzzle together. But Dave is troubled, really troubled. You can see in his eyes that he is carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. And in flashback, it is revealed what actually happened on the holiday. So no real spoilers, just the setup to the rest of the film. So one night on the holiday, Dave goes back to his room. His wife, Alice, is asleep. He wants to carry on partying. Goes back out, goes onto the beach, meets up with someone. Things happen that shouldn't. He ends up going to this bar on his own. This bar is not in a touristy type place at all. He shouldn't really be there. It's full of locals that are all being a bit hostile towards him and they basically want him to take a prostitute he wants nothing to do with that at all and this back door flings open and the prostitute's there and it's an eight-year-old girl dave goes absolutely ballistic screaming and shouting at them and then from the same room appears jeremy he comes out trying to calm everything down and says to dave stop the people that you're talking to are actually the Vietnamese Mafia. That's where I'll end the story. The main selling point to this film is the structure. The way it goes back and forth between current day Australia to the flashbacks of what happened on the holiday. While showing Dave's sort of varying degrees of his mental state is an absolute pleasure to watch. This film is just so naturalistic and realistic and the way that the three of them are sort of dealing with the disappearance and attempting to piece it together from all of these just these little circumstances whilst Dave is basically internally having a complete breakdown is really good stuff there's one pivotal scene in this film that pretty much haunts me and I cannot shake it off everyone needs to check out wish you were here so that was my top five Australian movies of the decade. And as always, I hope you've got some decent recommendations from that list. And I will be back again next week with another list in another genre. Cheers.